Okay, folks, I think we can get started here. Uh, again, my name is Mike Rothstein. I'm the senior partner executive with the Pranix, and I manage and I run the AWS partnership for Pranix. First and foremost, we want to thank you very much for attending today's webinar that was co-sponsored by us and AWS, and in particularly a, a strong thank you goes out to Peter Jones, who orchestrated uh, this co-webinar with the Pranix and his clients. And we really appreciate your time. First and foremost, thank you for your time. It's it's during uh, this time of a public health crisis. Your time is precious. And we really appreciate you sharing with us, uh, sharing this with us. So um, this this webinar will be based upon AWS as well architecture, well architect for cloud application resilience using a Pranix. And I had a question before we kick this off with some of the folks that are attending, some of the customers for AWS is if you could, Maybe in the chat bot or raise your hand. And how many of the how many online are born in the cloud customers for AWS? Would that be possible for you to just give us a show of hands or quickly pop that into the chat bot box? If you could. <clears throat> okay. Well, with that said, so this webinar will be based upon um, a discussion on how to utilize the board in the cloud board of the cloud application resilience to service to protect against you know obviously a, a multitude of failures including ransomware attacks cloud service disruption failures due to software updates and obviously cloud regional failures or disaster recoveries of pranix we offer an industry first cloud native backup recovery and restore your application environment along with advanced cloud application environment protection uh single zone and multi-region recovery so if you're really looking to achieve 50 percent better slos in your single cloud region or zone application with much better rtos um, we will provide you with that really comprehensive granular visibility into the robust capabilities of our solution and we'll focus on how we fully leverage all the aws cloud native services without any additional backup or data management or DR infrastructure, and really how you control costs due to unauthorized snapshots, know your cloud cost ahead of time, obviously by balancing between your RPO and RTO requirements and organization and compliance policies. And, you know, how, uh, you know, when we talk about application resilience, I mean, can you truly recover your entire application environment as it relates to your VMs? Uh, your containers, your load balancers, if you're running, utilizing load balancers, all your security groups, all your VPC components and configurations very, very quick, quickly. Um, rather than speak too much because time is of the essence, we want to ensure that you receive full granular visibility. We're going to provide you with a presentation, again, on AWS Well Architect Framework for AWS and a product's application resilience and we'll provide a, a nice high level presentation uh, as long with a demo of our solution with an environment that's running an open source environment that i'll be running on aws for the for the demo so uh, we want to thank you again uh we will um we will welcome q a in the chat in the chat uh, window uh after the presentation we'd love to field your questions and obviously uh, after what you see today with the capabilities we would really love to engage you um, potentially at a one on one and you can facilitate that engagement, obviously, through Peter Jones, uh, your account manager at AWS. So without further ado, to, to maximize the time uh, that we have together this afternoon for the hour on the call, I'm going to turn this over to our CEO and our founder, Bogan, uh, Govin Ragasamy, and he will take you through um this presentation so thank you for joining we're looking forward to uh to presenting you with um our application resiliency platform and the unique robust capabilities and benefits of using a Pranix. so go ahead govin hey thank you mike thank you for your introduction i hope uh, you guys are able to hear me and uh, again on behalf of Pranix and the team really appreciate the time you have taken to listen to us uh, during this uh covid19 situation really appreciate it so uh, what we are and what we do uh, is that uh, through and through uh, we provide cloud application resiliency and the cloud application resiliency is not possible if you consider just you know aws the way uh, uh, legacy applications being operated or even the cloud native applications getting operated right there is always this well-architected framework 
available from AWS, and they've been preaching uh, for a long time. You know, when you operate on uh, the cloud platforms like AWS, it's better that you take advantage of these services. And um, a lot of organizations, they uh, first of all struggle to take advantage because there's so much to be done. Uh, there's always so much to be done, and uh, too few people to take care of the, uh, the, the applications in, in production and everything else. So what we do is that uh, when it comes to resiliency, when it comes to uh, protecting your environment for multiple reasons and recovering them, you know, uh, you could very easily offload that pain uh, over to a service uh, and it's completely a service based. So there is nothing to install, none of that. And you know how we can do it. So from a, an application uh, overview perspective, uh, we support both uh, cloud native and cloud enabled. Let me clarify the cloud enabled part and then uh, directly going to the cloud native as well. Both of them kind of um, are supported in our platform. Cloud uh, enabled applications are the ones that are uh, migrated from the uh, you know data center over to the cloud and you enable them with cloud native infrastructure services, right? Could be virtual machines, could be load balancers, could be many of the wonderful software defined infrastructure that are running on top of uh, AWS. Cloud native uh, more or less is taken over by this container and Kubernetes uh, world, but that is not the case here. When, when you talk about cloud native, uh, you know, it involves pretty much creating uh, the application from scratch on AWS itself. It's not just the container part, right? So can we throw in containers here uh, because, you know, more, more organizations are associated cloud native means it's container and Kubernetes. That's not the case, but two different application types. That's the idea of highlighting these two areas. Uh, but in essence, uh, it is the entire application environment that Appranix really protects and recovers, right? As opposed to the legacy approach. Um, over a period of time, uh, let's say in the last uh, seven to uh, eight years or so, uh, you know, you've seen more and more ransomware attacks and they are increasing day by day, even during this COVID-19 situation. I think some of these attacks are, attackers rather, are taking advantage of this uh, work from home situation where teams cannot really come together to recover the environment. So why not encrypt everything and then, you know, throw a, a kind of a mess around that and then ask for ransom. That's happening in some areas where some attackers have politely refused to attack the, you know, let's say hospitals and uh, sensitive, uh, healthcare sensitive uh, information systems. But others, uh, you know, they are struggling. And uh, of course, customers won't come and tell openly that they have been attacked. Uh, and I come to know, uh, even within our customer base, I know a couple of them have been attacked in the last three months or so. And so in those situations, how do you really deal with the recovery of your applications, right? And what kind of protection can we do? It's not about detecting the ransomware, it's about recovering from the ransomware attacks. And given that uh, AWS has been, uh, you know, advising the customers and, and pro providing solutions in terms of what is that shared responsibility model, uh, and, and I think just uh, everyone might be knowing this, but just throwing this information, uh, so you un understand the clarity between what is uh, AWS responsibility with respect to their SLAs and service security and so on, and what is the customer responsibility? The customers are responsible for their implementation, their configuration of the applications, and also the backup and recovery, uh, we call it as in the resiliency component of the application as well, and of course, the security component. So clearly defined shared responsibility model on the cloud and uh, and that is when you know when a traditional applications migrate over to the cloud uh, we kind of educate that as part of our story uh, but if you are or if you have been running on aws for a long time we don't have to say that i think you understand it pretty pretty, pretty well and particularly around the application resiliency component of it if we think about how do you really define the resiliency Resiliency could be defined in multiple ways. So one is, you know, as long as the applications continue to run, no matter what happens to the cloud infrastructure, it's one way to look at the resiliency, right? And the other way, much deeper way to look at the resiliency is to know 
what is your sla what is your application sla uh, is it uh, directly related to the application infrastructure sla which is basically the cloud infrastructure right so if you think about the infrastructure sla that you can figure for your applications those infrastructures could come from different different services of aws it could be from ec2 that has a different sla and also you know in the fine prints you will have an sla for individual virtual machine versus the entire environment type of virtual machine and also the type of virtual machines that you kind of configure so if you go with micro across all your application environments you know what kind of sla you're going to get right some of the micros are free and in fact all the t2 micros are free and uh, if you think about uh, let's say the ec2 storage environment it's a different sla your rds has a different sla your load balancer has a different sla right and everything all these services are running in a shared infrastructure cloud model which means that what is your application sla is it going is it 99 or is it 99.9 or what is it right so if that's the case do you really know your sla what is your maximum disruption that you can really uh, at least understand and also um, advertise if you are running uh, uh, on a public cloud environment and to your customer what you really promise and when you look at from that perspective then you'll have to really think about uh, maybe tiers of applications you know the tiers of applications could be tier one application where platinum level sla needs to be provided all the way to tier four type of application where uh, you know, as long as you can recover it in about a day or so, not a problem. So it varies, uh, and and I'm hoping that you have pretty good understanding of what is that SLA that you really care for your application, and how do you really put together the resiliency corresponding to that SLA to satisfy that application SLA. Now, given that AWS best practices, mm -hmm. as part of the AWS Well Architected Framework, is about you know 75 plus pages long document you know you could go and refer if you don't have it please send us an email mike we will be happy to send uh, that particular uh, pointer and the pdf uh, including to you so that you can look at what's going on inside so when you go through quickly you know um, there are pages where you describe you know, when when you get to know a lot of your application architectures and so on particularly around the pages between 50 and 70 you will come across a kind of a playbook a run book almost where you know if you did these 15 different things then you'll be able to achieve much better resiliency and that involves and you know, i don't have to read through all of them involves cloud formation infrastructure as code uh, consistent deployment models application monitoring alarm and other things you know, in terms of monitoring and alarm and log analytics and a lot of these companies uh, you might be doing that you know day in day out not a problem but what's missing and what we find is that whenever we talk to large enterprises that have even uh, moved from the data center uh, after two three years they realize that they don't have the right setup to begin with and then uh, you know, you'll, you'll be surprised to find that they are not really taking advantage of all these capabilities available. To begin with, did you know that infrastructure uh, means on AWS, you know, you have 20 different regions, 61 availability zones as of today, maybe tomorrow it's 65 because they are increasing the number of availability zones, right? Uh, on the Virginia region, you have six different ones. And then Ohio region, you have four. And then Canada, you have two different, I think the second region is coming up and you will have number of zones are you really taking advantage of all of that and just think about all the situation if you are familiar with a uh, you know data center model type of situations where you know having a second data center and having a dark fiber to connect them it's such a hassle too much work too much maintenance all of that put together if you try to create a second data center for, to fail over infrastructure it's too much too expensive, too cumbersome, too much maintenance, all of that hassle. And on top of that, if you have to really fade over your application to another data center, and in this particular could, could be just another zone, then it becomes a lot more problem. And if you try to um, architect in such a way that you can fail over between two zones, that's one way to look at it. But most of the cases, what happens is that, you know, what happens to the data? Are you really failing over your databases as well over to the other side? If that's the case, what happens when you scale between the two? So in essence, 
AWS has a very prescriptive approach for your well-architected uh, framework. And the checklist goes like you know five pages long, just on the DR side. And I'm not going to walk through every one of them that involves uh, your network considerations, your environment considerations, including infrastructure as code, your storage configurations, and application readiness checks, and so on. So plenty of material in terms of uh, at least to begin thinking about it and also begin to understand where else you can take advantage of AWS native capabilities without really kind of putting together, bolting on additional data management infrastructure or application uh, specific uh, uh, protection and so on. So it is not just you, right? It is, you know, it's a lot of these companies that have gone to the cloud, maybe born in the cloud, but at the end of the day, they are all realizing that uh, it is it is it is important to go to the next step. That next step is about increasing the resiliency, and you are not alone. When you know Gartner clearly has documented uh, back in 2019, they, they wrote a very lengthy document, and that uh, is based on client inquiries. The inquiries on cloud resilience alone spiked. Um, in fact, started spiking uh, 2016 onwards, uh, particularly in the financial services area. And uh, you know, one of our uh, big customers is a financial services customer, and we realize that you know, uh, first of all, they are not able to take advantage of it. The reason for that is very, very simple. You know, sometimes when you dig deeper, the reasons could be just people, uh, because there's so much to be done, and more and more infrastructures are coming in, and uh, and more automation means you know, you throw in an application load balancer, the application load balancer automatically scales that environment. So. Am I supposed to take care of the new virtual machines that are dynamically created, uh, along with the things that I've been monitoring, managing, and cost, you know, from a cost perspective as well? So, particularly on the application resilience, particularly around, um, you know, worrying about the application resilience, what we see is enormous complexities. One, uh, typically, uh, you will end up managing some kind of a, a backup solution. It could be uh, you know, one of those uh, uh, legacy backup solutions or it could be the one directly coming from AWS you know, uh, solution as well. Uh, you'll end up, uh, uh, if, if you're going with an AWS solution, uh, if there is a full capability around it, uh, then you can start as a service, but you'll end up installing agents in every one of the virtual machines, right? So. When you have those agents running um, in the, the known application environment, known instances, that was totally fine. But what happens when you auto scale those instances? What happens when you have to manage that data management infrastructure itself for backup? Are you running that backup infrastructure and the backup managers and so on in a highly available manner? Where is it running? Is it running in one particular zone? What if that zone gets attacked with a ransomware attack? And you can you cannot even get to the backup manager. So if that's the case, how would you recover from it? Second part is that the network congestion associated with it. So if you install the agents or some other mechanism, you'll have to. I'm talking about application consistent mechanism of backing up. And what happens is that you will have to pull in the data using the same network that is supporting your production environments. So the production environments. You know, you will have to throw more workloads if the production environment is congested. So, in, in it's a double whammy, if you will. One is your backup uh, SLA is hurting because you are not able to pull the data quick enough to satisfy one hour backup window or even less, uh, depending on the situation. And on top of that, you are spinning up more because your production workloads are busy, CPU is busy because the agent is running, right? And this is just about the backup. If you uh, lose a virtual machine, how do I get it back? Because I had all the configurations and everything. Uh, if I have complete uh, kind of a deployment type of scenario, you could deploy another cloud formation or a Terraform thing, but you're spinning up new instances, right? So what happens? Uh, that becomes a problem. And if that's the case, just the backup alone, it's an issue. Now you bring in a DR, typically the DR systems are a separate systems completely because you know in order to bring up a DR, then you'll have to really look at bringing up multitudes of those virtual machines and the related infrastructure and so on. Right. On top of that, you'll end up managing the life cycle of the storage behind all of this. Right. What happens to the buckets that you're storing, and uh, do I have to monitor that, or 
the backup systems automatically take care of it? What if those uh, data points are, are kind of lost? So if you're putting uh, kind of a, an agent uh, on the uh, for the backup, when you pull the data, they are not native format, right? They are converted into a generic format. So if you're running a Linux uh, operating system with a particular file system under Windows operating with NTFS, in the backup manager will have a common uh, file system to backup. So when you convert it, it converts back. So recovery becomes too difficult. Forget about the disaster recovery where you will have to recover, um, you know, hundreds and hundreds of uh, virtual machines at the same time. And other services associated with if you're running RDS, how would you recover that point in time? And when you recover, now you have to really think about infrastructure as code. Cloud formation infrastructure as code, uh, not only talking about, you know, spinning up the VPC with some kind of a Terraform or cloud formation, I'm talking about the entire infrastructure coming up for your application environment. Then if you if you wrote one of that, it could be multiples of cloud formation together because you have nested formations and so on. If you have really wrote one of uh, written one of those, if not, then you will have to really think about writing and representing your environment, right? And then bringing along all other cloud services configurations. So at that particular point in time, if you're running a load balancer, load balancer is managing uh, an auto scaling uh, component of your application then what is the load, ba load balancer configuration? What is the security group between uh, your two instances that are talking to each other? And if you change one of the security groups because anyone could change from authority to a cloud ops engineer or even the you know, developers depending on the application configuration. So if you change it, what is the guarantee that you can recover that environment, right? Most of all, if you get attacked with the ransomware recovery, then what happens? Can you confidently recover your application environment? And in all in all, what we have identified is that this is really based on the real data from an enterprise customer running on AWS and has been running on AWS for four and a half years. Right? In this environment is about 370 virtual machines and about 3,000 plus resources instances. You know, it could be security groups, VPCs load balancers, you name it, a ton of them. And what we really understood is that they're only covering 12% of the cloud application environment because in the data center world, it's different. But even in the cloud world, they kind of mimic the same approach. Okay, I can protect the VMs, right? I can protect the database separately, but that is not the issue. It is the environment. So in that case, we ask the question, are your cloud applications really protected? And it becomes, you know, like four or five different products and then custom code and so on. That is where we come in. You don't need it. You know, not from a complexity perspective, not from the maintenance nightmare perspective, but also from a cost perspective, right? It is a rough comparison of what's going on, you know, it's a kind of a legacy tools versus Sopranix cost. It's very, very simple to make out, right? It's flat, 25 per instance per month, and then cloud infrastructure is got. So how easy? We are actually, we take pride of saying this multiple times. Unfortunately, nowadays I don't go to Starbucks to onboard, and I have literally done that before COVID-19 situation, where you go to the marketplace, AWS marketplace or Google marketplace, uh, rather uh, in this particular case, AWS marketplace, where we have two different products, uh, pay as you go model as well as annual subscription model. You subscribe, you get an account um, uh, ID uh, pop-up, and you key in the account ID, then you go in, log in, and onboard your application. I will go through the demo uh, to be specific. And once you add your policy, resiliency policies, uh, Pranix automatically creates something called an application environment time machine. I'm sure a lot of you might be familiar with uh, an Apple time machine or something like that. Think about that, right? Uh, think about an application environment time machine where uh, your application environments are continuously captured, including all the configurations, everything together, and it appears something like this, right? Your application environment is not uh, just uh, made of bunch of instances and the services and so on. It is actually a combination of all of these services, configuration of all of those services, connectivity, of all of those services, 
dependency between those services, which one starts first, which one starts second, and so on. And the key thing is it changes over a period of time. It doesn't stop. So every minute it changes, could be depending on the application type that you are running, it changes, which means that application environment needs to be kept somewhere, just the configurations and how those environment configurations are monitored, right? And how would you really tackle that in terms of, you know, if a failure happens at this particular point in time, how do you go back? If a failure happens at this particular point in the back when yesterday or a week ago, a month ago, how do you go back in time? And what kind of infrastructure code is this? Is this the same code that you had? And what is the dependencies for that? And that is a problem. Without really understanding, without really kind of mapping this, it becomes really, really hard for people to put together the resiliency and ultimately answer that critical question for your business, what is my SLA, right? Especially when you're running on a public cloud infrastructure. And public cloud infrastructure regions and zones are created for a very specific reason because Amazon used to, Amazon.com runs all the time, but some applications running on Amazon AWS and web services, they fail. Right. Uh, I don't know if you guys remember uh, back in the day when Netflix went down, uh, it, it, they couldn't blame AWS. Of course, there was some kind of a blame going on between back and forth between the infrastructure provider and the application guys. But at the end of the day, Netflix changed the architecture. Right. Netflix changed the architecture to be resilient so that they can uh, fail over to any region at any point in time. And you don't see the failure anymore because Netflix spent time, energy, in fact, wrote a bunch of tools to make sure that they are resilient, right? And now they are. And that's the reason why the company is doing very well. And we are bringing that capability. We cannot solve all your problems running on AWS, but we can solve one problem, and that is resiliency. And that is why customers like LoadSpring and others are trusting us. Um, you know, some of the, the, the words that we are hearing uh, are, are making our teams um, you know, really proud. And uh, those are really, really kind of encouraging us to go and educate more and more AWS customers that um, perhaps you are missing something, perhaps it's time to evaluate it. And evaluation is very, very simple, right? And uh, um, it's free for 15 days. Don't worry about the cost and everything. Test it. If you're satisfied, uh, you could continue. Otherwise, you don't have to. So number of uh, and, uh, big companies, you can see the amount of data some of these companies really, really kind of protect uh, in the back end. Um, and and it's, it's, uh, it's really, really good. Not only AWS, but other clouds as well. So under the hood, Apranix SaaS runs on the cloud with AWS well-architected baseline review included. So we made sure that we satisfy AWS requirement of that resiliency on our own and also the security. The most important part uh, is the security part of uh, this, this capability. We do not take your data, right? We, the, we simply query the metadata of your service infrastructure and we orchestrate your data, orchestrate your um, services and make sure that you can back up and recover right inside your account nothing comes out of your account with respect to your property data. So you're free to run your healthcare information, your financial services information, or any of the very most sensitive uh, information that you do. Uh, and it's all completely using AWS capabilities. So, uh, and we call it as time uh, and, and my application environment time machine. And it continues to learn and continues to provide application resiliency day in, day out. So with that, um, uh, you can also integrate uh, with your DevOps pipeline. If you have a DevOps pipeline, if you're a DevOps shop, uh, you can very easily integrate that with a single line. If you know you create an assembly one time and then uh, plug in this code into your pipeline, you're all set. Apranix will automatically take care of making the copies and you can use it for many purposes, including sometimes uh, if you had a bad deployment, you can very easily go back in time so that at least you borrow time to fix the issue and come back again, right? So, uh, you know, the, 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 the platform capability allows you to, um, you know, secure your resiliency in multiple ways, not just a, 
a deployment issue or ransomware attack issue or um, you know, a single service failure within AWS or the entire region failure, the worst case scenario, right? That doesn't happen all the time, but it does happen once in a while. That you know, all it takes is once, right? Uh, and that is when uh, the resiliency is important. Anyway, so with that, uh, what I'm going to do is to jump on a demo right away uh, without delaying. So what uh, for that, uh, we'll, we'll start from the AWS Marketplace. AWS Marketplace and Apranix. So all you have to do is to type AWS and Apranix. It um, lands right there in the uh, Marketplace and you can go in, uh, click subscribe. I already subscribed, so I don't want to subscribe again. Uh, you will be prompted to give in your email address and your account name, you know, whatever the account name that you want to do. And you will get an email, log into the email, set your password, ready to go. So that's how I kind of dialed in uh, into um, this uh, demo account. So what I'm going to do is to sign out and sign back in, and just to give you an idea of uh, what you could do. So it's a demo account for me and it runs um, uh, as a service as you know, you log in and as soon as you log in, uh, you will be prompted to something called a cloud connection here, right? The cloud connection will let you connect a Pranix with your um, cloud environment. Mm -hmm. And for me, the cloud environment is running on uh, the Virginia region and that is running a bunch of instances and uh, the instances are connected uh, with load balancers and uh, you know multitudes of configurations underneath. Uh, if you have RDS instances, you know you go into RDS specific ones, and uh, and also uh, particularly the VPC configurations underneath. So if you go into the VPC for that region in my account, it's a very simple account. I mean, it could be very very complicated uh, for some of you. Uh, you can see the number of VPCs, the subnets, and route tables, and the internet gateways, and all of the necessary configurations. And any of them at any point in could change. This is the beauty of the cloud. And that allows you to kind of change um, easily, uh, but be careful before changing. But even if you changed it, not a problem uh, because you know Apranix is there to, uh, to protect it and go back in time as well. So this environment uh, runs an application in this particular case, an application like this. It is an emergency medical records application. You can see the patients, um, and uh, you know uh, the entire uh, hospital administration uh, part messaging, uh, just to show that this is uh, a, a critical application, right? So open EMR, open source EMR, emergency medical records application here, and uh, just for demo purposes, and that runs on uh, these instances that are uh, being hosted on the East Coast, so Northern Virginia. Uh, so what we are going to do is to discover this environment quickly. So cloud connection is very simple. Assuming that you logged in, all you have to do is to uh, AWS uh, well-connected webinar connection, right? Name it appropriately so that I can delete it afterwards. So connected grant role-based access. This is the default access for um, uh, AWS nowadays because um, uh, at the end of the day, um, you know, it's well architected uh, approach that we have followed and baseline review as well with AWS. Uh, and, um, you know, that's how you can get in. You can connect your account. Now, you you discover your environment that we call it as a primary region. And if you have dot data sovereignty, that might be the case if you're running on the Canadian region and you want to just go, you know, if it is just one region, you can restrict everything to within the region, but between two uh, zones of, of the region. If you have flexibility to go across, let's say the US, no problem. You can also throw in California region uh, as one of the regions or any other uh, regions as well. So you can pretty much configure two, three, multiple regions so that you can keep copies of the storage is cheap uh, to an extent, right? And everything is incremental. So one copy, first copy, golden copy, if you will, everything else is incremental copy. So as I showed you that that multiple environment configuration is exactly what and how it manages inside. So once you pick and select your services, you can also, you know, if you don't want your load balancer, classical load balancer, just get rid of it. Everything else uh, can be uh, added. And you can also add the service if you want to add back the classical load balancer here. Now, click next. 
what um, Pranix does here is that it goes and generates that um, cloud formation template based on your selections. What do you do? Uh, you launch that cloud formation into your account. So in this particular case, AX demo account in the Northern Virginia, I'm giving permission to allow. And these permissions are based on, again, AWS uh, well architected. You can see it's an ARN resource uh, identification. Um, most of them may not run on the root account. So I happen to just uh, configure it quickly so you can run it on the root account or sub accounts. You know, the best practice is you run it on a sub account. And once you acknowledge, uh, it goes and uh, runs the stack, cloud formation stack. So it's again native, right? We, it's, it's pretty much leveraging all the wonderful capabilities of AWS uh, native. And it pretty much uh, creates the IAM policy required to get the permission, to read the permission, to read the metadata and so on. And if you have to recover in another region, then we would need the permission to create those virtual machines, create the load balancer and so on. But again, runs on within your account, right? We only need the permission to do that. And you can get rid of this permission if you're not satisfied with Apronix, get rid of this permission by getting rid of that permission policy inside, right? So once, once it runs, uh, the output gives you, uh, creation is complete. So the output gives you an ARN. You simply cut and paste that ARN here and that ARN will look like this, uh, and you simply connect the cloud. Uh, when you connect the cloud, Pranix goes and discovers everything from your AWS account, for the perm wherever the permission was given, right? So it goes and discovers, it discovers all the services, uh, application load balancer, the compute network, and RDS, and so on, depending on whatever you are running, and more. It is not just that, main services it is everything within that environment think about that environment as uh, the environment that i showed you here right this is the thing uh, all of that but the, the dependency and uh, connectivity information has been has not been cal calculated yet because that is when we call it as an assembly so you simply represent your assembly i already created an assembly so i'm not going to run through the entire thing when you name the assembly and then uh, you uh, pick up a policy, you know, you want to, uh, you know, hourly protection, daily protection, yearly, or a combination of uh, these. You can have multiple uh, protections as well. Uh, sometimes you might want to do 15 minutes. A customer with a contractually obligated SLA, that's a 15 minute uh, protection as well. Uh, but we wouldn't recommend for your entire assembly, uh, maybe for some of the you know, smaller services, because you are pushing AWS to the limit at the time, right? Um, and you know you can you can uh, pick that, and you could say immediately or specific time, not a problem. Uh, already exists, so I would say test uh, two. Say that, and then go to the next step, and you select the recovery region just in case if you changed your mind, right? Uh, recovery test as well, so you can select that and you select the uh, VPC, uh, we discover all the VPC. So select the VPC, in this particular case, the production VPC here, and the production VPC gives you that instances that you discovered here. So if you think about it, those instances are running and those instances have been discovered. So you can look at the properties of the instances, all of that. So what happened to other services, right? That's the beauty of it. You are not asking too much information. You would know that, I'm running all of, only one of, uh, you know, few of these services anyway. So those services I know make up my application environment. Everything else, Appranix takes care of it. So when you uh, create that assembly, in, in, in my case, I created this assembly called OpenAMR. And if you go into the resources tab, you'll see you end up selecting only those application instances, Appranix takes care of the rest. It knows how to bring in other resources corresponding to your infrastructure that you specify, meaning the compute infrastructure that you specify. And the load balance, you could have 146 load balances, just like another one of our customers. And we pick the load balance that is really important or connected to that particular compute set of computes, right? And you know the policies you put in, weekly policy, daily, hourly policy, and so on, they are there. And uh, you'll see uh, this is your application environment time machine. You can go and uh, 
based on your policies over a period of time uh, you can go back in time right and go back and recover so what i'm going to do i'm going to kill this environment just for the demo purposes i'm actually simulating this application um you know problem issues i'm going to stop that i'm going to stop in the northern virginia region i'm going to just say stop all the instances so in essence killing my application right so once i stop my instances what happens to my application is that i refresh this and the application is dead so what i'm going to do is to now i am panicking at the moment i don't know what to do it could be you know i want to come back from the uh, one hour ago or i want to go back for, you know uh, yesterday or you know day for yesterday it doesn't matter so let's pick up one of those let's pick up um, you know a couple of days ago because you know a couple of days ago it was working fine a weekly cap capture if you look at the weekly one at the time the configuration might be different you know compute network interfaces could be different configuration could be completely different that's the case what would that be uh, what is the copy that was made from your primary region to the other region so what we are going to do is to hit the recover button and a week ago uh, recovery right perfect and then i'm going to just recover it if you had given only one in this particular if you have given two we'll ask you to pick if you have given only one it automatically identify that's the case so you go fast as quickly as possible and say recover it and by the way if you are just testing your recoveries you could let apranix know that clean up that environment after one hour so most of the time what happens is that when you spin up a similar production environment even though the data copy is very very incremental is already there it will be very less and your you know your environment could come up so which means you are coming consume compute and other things what we say that configure it you you, you set it and forget it right Appliance will take care of it and gives you an approximate time frame because it would kick in and then clean up. Clean up could take a little bit of time, but it will kick in at 5:45. At 4:45, we started roughly 5:45. So recover it. Uh, let Appliance do the magic. So what happens is that all these instances and the resources from a week ago is getting recreated in the other region. I right? think about that. Right? You you don't even know what happened a week ago. And I don't even know what I configured in my production environment a week ago. And I mean that could be 15 minutes ago as well, right? So a week ago I had no idea and and uh, my production environment just went down. So what's happening behind the scene? Appliance is doing all the work. It is doing all the work to a point where it is let's go to the uh, california region right, where things are kind of uh, getting created automatically magically and you'll see uh, there is a week ago recovery spun up and the resources that are getting created here you see all the internet gateways all my route tables are getting created right? security groups are getting created vpc defaults all of that is getting created right and then if i look at the template and take the template designer and that is when i realized that you know i didn't have to even worry about the dependency between the components right how do i know what kind of dependencies were there at that point in time so here it was dynamically created right think about this and think about what i showed you before is this same exact thing you know i said simply this is the environment that um we create and now it is it's going back in time right doing all the work automatically you know you don't have to worry about when cloud formation changes were introduced instead of nested attack version 1 it could be nested 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 attack and the stack could be complicated in multiple ways it could be um, you know and also there is there are restrictions with respect to how many resources can you throw in into a particular um, uh, cloud formation right all of that you you leave it to cloud from the good thing about this approach is that uh, even if something bad happens it's almost like a transaction you can revert back and fire it again uh, aws will take care of it. aws is responsible for running that cloud formation so in essence taking full advantage of a wonderful capabilities available on aws right now 
you know these instances are coming up at that particular point and which means that the volumes were created at that point in time a week ago magically from those snapshots so you go back in time you look at the data from that point in time and the the configuration on the load balancer so i had the load balancer one week ago i had no idea how many vms were spun up at the time for that internal database load balancer internal application load balancer and then i set up some listeners at the time i even completely forgot what those listeners were i included some tags i had no idea it could be you know hundreds of tags here all of that will come up just like your production copy right and this is running in california and i will show you how automatically you could delete that as well so all of that will magically come up and uh, your production environment is dead anyway. So all of these are already running, right? And if you look at uh, um, recovery was completed in about three minutes and 15 seconds. And it also says that it will reset, right? At 5.49. Because we completed at 4.49. In one hour, it will automatically reset. If you go into every one of these um, configurations, you will see all the uh, resources that were created here, all of them, right? And if you want to do audit of your logs, go ahead and do it because all of that is present here. So you can just export it and check what's happening, what really, who spun up, right? Um, you know, an authorized person or unauthorized person. So now think about it. If you are managing your own snapshots and you know, when you manage your own snapshots, uh, just like the, the enterprise customer that tried to manage their own snapshots and they only got 60,000 of them. And you know, what happens to the life cycle of it? Even if you let some of the services to handle your snapshot, what happens to that particular snapshot a week ago across all my instances? And how does that particular snapshot um, get connected to a particular VM and the VM instance type? is supposed to be exactly the same thing. If not, identify the next big one so that in the second region, you can run your application. If that's the case, how would that instance be connected to my uh, application configuration, application infrastructure configuration, and everything else? In other words, all that complexity is taken away. All you have to worry about is to make sure that how do you run your application environment in the production environment, right? The resiliency part is easy. And of course, when you have a Pranix. So let me stop here and see if there are questions. And we are at uh, like eight minutes into uh, the conversation here, um, you know, before the webinar ends, I am mindful of uh, uh, that, that time. Uh, while we do this, you know, you can switch the DNS over to the East Coast. So I simply fail over. Uh, do the failover of the application here. So let it uh, fail over the DNS. I need to fail over the DNS, otherwise it won't point to uh, the other uh, region. So let it let it fail over, let it catch up, and see if there are questions that are coming in. Any questions? Um, You can type it in. I think in, in the webinar is kind of a little tricky to to see the questions. Uh, if not, no. You know Peter. Uh, you know us now. Uh, feel free to kind of ping us anytime. Uh, send us an email, uh, or go ahead and try it. Right? It is as simple as that. Okay. Um, any other thoughts? Uh, I, I think the failover. It's verifying the application URL, so it will go and verify the application has come up or not. Okay. And you can see the instances are all running, running state, checks are over, and the VPC configuration in the other region. That is another set of things. So the VPC configuration is very, very key, because in the other region, all the configurations of the VPC need to be brought up. So you can see all of the relevant ones, not the unnecessary ones, all the relevant ones for that application uh, should be brought up. The route tables, uh, internet gateways, uh, network huckles, um, all of that 
if you have three subnets or 15 subnets, it doesn't matter. We'll, uh, you know, Apranix will automatically figure that out for you. All right. Mike, do you see any um, uh, questions popping up? If not, um, this is, uh, can... yeah, thank yeah, thanks, Govan. This was terrific. Thanks for the presentation. And more importantly, we want to thank um, AWS customers who joined, signed up. We're very, very thankful. Um, again, like Govan said, if uh, it'd be great um, to uh, have a 